welcome to Horse Rail Arena this afternoon for our last um, session for the day. Uh, so today uh, we have Kathleen Mullen. Uh, she is an equine health and welfare manager for Harness Racing Australia, the peak governing body for the standard breeds in Australia. Now Kathleen is best known for her history making turn in the prestigious Gary Owen equestrian turnout in 2013 aboard her chestnut gelding MF Hollywood. So can you all welcome uh, Kathleen to this session today? Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, let's all be very impressed with uh, Buck who's come a country mile through back of house and had to stand there while I got wired for sound. Um, that's just the typical standard red attitude for you, isn't it? So, as we've mentioned, I'm Kathleen Mullen. This is Buck, uh, formerly known as Save Some Time to Dream. Um, so Buck is an 11 year old standard bred gelding. So he is a veteran of 113 race starts. Uh, he's 20 wins for $222,000 in prize money. So he's done a really great job on the track um, as a race horse. So he raced through um, as a two and three year old. Um, I was chatting with his race owner earlier today and um, as a three year old, he won quite a number of races in a row and um, he was rated up in the top sort of two or three, three year old um, colts and geldings in the country. So he's, um, he's certainly no slouch on the racetrack and he finished his career late in 2017. And um, at that point in time, uh, myself at Harness Racing Australia was starting to look for a project for an ambassador type horse to, to take on a role um, whereby, whereby we can re-educate him and get everyone to follow along with the process. Um, I know that you see a lot of the, the really great standard breads now that are getting around in the performance arena and everyone sort of thinks that, well, perhaps they just start that way. And, um, they certainly don't start that way. It takes a little bit of time and effort, but what I'm here to talk about today is the fact that it doesn't take as much time or effort or magic as, um, as everyone seems to think. It's really a matter of um, really good, proper, solid training. I subscribe to a lot of Andrew McLean's methods. So a lot of you, I think his uh, stand is actually in the building here today, the equitation science. And a lot of the training that, um, that I do and, and have built upon with my time with the standard breads has been um, based on a lot of their training and, um, and theories, which it does actually, it's science-based and it's the way that a horse learns. And for Buck and for any of the other standard breads that I've re-educated over the, the last few years, it, it has really been something that I found as a method that works. So what I'm gonna do today is actually run through literally the last six months of Buck's life, because that's something that I want you to keep in mind throughout today's presentation is the fact that in May, Buck had never seen a saddle before. Um, he'd not been ridden as a racehorse. Often a lot of your standard breeds will at some point have been ridden bareback or backed or um, they may have even raced in the Monty races, which is obviously a, a saddle racing um, thing that's going on. That It's not super popular, but there will be some horses that have been ridden, but Buck was certainly not the case. Having said that, when I backed him, I did ring his race trainer to confirm because he was um, really very, very good about the whole situation. So what I'm gonna do is try and condense six months of work into 45 minutes. Um, and at the beginning of that, what I actually need to do is go slow to go fast and jump off. Everything, oops, my mic's dropped out. Everything that you do under saddle comes from the ground in some way, shape or form. Um, with an off-the-track standard bread, you obviously have got them really well mouthed already. They've got used to a bridle. They're actually used to a hell of a lot of gear. So you're a long way in front from that side of things because you already have a horse that's reasonably well mouthed, a horse that if it's raced has been on the float, it's been to the trials, it's done, it's had a little bit of life experience. Um, they're obviously used to a saddle of some description, clearly a little bit smaller than that one that's on him today, but a girth and things like that um, is not an unfamiliar thing. So you are a long way in front in terms of, of backing a horse. You're not backing a, a completely green horse that's never seen any of this stuff before. But there are some standard bred specific things, little traits, little triggers and stuff um, that I'm gonna hopefully go through today and give you some hints, tips and advice on. Um, starting on the ground, these guys usually have really good ground manners. As a general rule, um, genetically, they are a fairly placid breed and they are a fairly 
um, adaptable and they take on quite a lot. So genetically they're already a little way in front and then of course if they've had any kind of race training they have had lots of gear, harness and a cart on. That means that a lot of their um, a lot of their buttons and groundwork on the ground are usually pretty good. However, I always like to have a look at that on the ground and, and make sure that I've got some stuff before I get on board. So the first thing that I want to do is make sure and I test that he leads forward from a light um, contact on his mouth. So he's trying to sneak forward and show off because clearly we did this yesterday and he knows the drill. Um, what I want him to do is to lead off off that very light contact and to stay walking in a reasonable rhythm and a reasonable frame. I don't want him to barge off. I don't want to have to drag him. And again, in the same motion, I want to check that he halts kindly off of a soft aid, that he's not reefing the reins forward or taking the bridle um, out of my hands or anything like that. Unfortunately, Buck's too good a student and I can't really demonstrate to you the wrong things. Taught him too well. But you really will need to have stop and go really well installed. Off of that light, it's no good just walking him up and down and being okay with dull responses. If I've got to drag him forward to get him to walk and I've got to haul him back to stop him, that's not off a light aid. Ideally, within two or three beats of you making the request, the horse needs to accede to that request. Um, so getting that, as boring as this all seems, oh, I'm leading the horse around, um, it's really critical. And when I get on board, you'll sort of see where this all ties back. Um, Deepening of that stop response can come if the horse is quite a, um, quite a strong horse, doesn't stop off of soft aid, or um, as a lot of standees I want to do, they have a little bit of a reef forward and they take the reins forward. You deepen that response by actually asking him to step backwards. And I can use my whip on his chest if he's not stepping back as softly as I would. And again, you can use the whip on the shoulder for a horse that's a little bit dull and not stepping forward. With all of this groundwork, and it does obviously then translate into your work under saddle, timing is critical. You need to really make sure that you've got your timing sorted. And by timing, I mean the release of the pressure. All of this is pressure release training. Essentially, you know, the, the very famous saying is that, you know, um, if I sit on a pin, what do I do? Well, you get up. Why do you get up? And everyone normally answers, well, because it hurts. And the correct answer is actually you get up because it stops hurting. And the same concept applies here. When I'm pulling on the reins, I've got pressure behind his ears. In order for me to remove or for him to get that pressure to stop, he needs to step forward. So he needs to make a really direct correlation between me pulling forward and him stepping forward. And the same with the stop. And my release, the minute that his legs have stopped moving, I haven't got any further pressure on his mouth. So what you really want to do is work on that timing because that's absolutely critical in terms of getting the right responses. If the horse is unclear as to what you're asking him, you're not going to get anywhere. And that's the same for any breed. This is not rocket science specific for standard breeds. Um, so the other thing that we need to work on, and Buck was a little bit painful about this yesterday because there's a lot going on. And as I said, he's six months into his retraining process and technically this is his third outing. So he's doing a great job in terms of um, taking on a lot of what's going on here today. So what I'll need to do, and what I said he was a little bit ratty about yesterday, was park. Park is absolutely what it sounds like. I need him, once I've stopped him, I've taken the pressure off the reins, I should be able to step away from him and move around. I don't want him to follow me. That's one of the biggest things. We all think our horses lead really well till we take them to an event, and suddenly they're under pressure, and we realise they're really just only following us around. The place that that becomes really apparent is often if you've got a horse that's bad to load onto a float, where they won't just follow you because the stimulus to get on the scary float versus the stimulus to follow you is not equal. They're not working off of an aid. So you can see Buck sneaks forward and each time I just really calmly correct him and place his feet back where they were. And again, I try and step away. I've got no pressure. There's no aids being applied here. I'm not tapping in with my whip. I'm not pulling on the reins. So therefore he should park. But he's under pressure, he's here. There's a lot going on, there's people behind him, there's people beside him. Um, I'm yakking into a microphone. All of that stuff is not something that he would normally have to deal with. So that's where you know, proof of concept comes in. You can do this all at home 
You need to be able to then test it out at a show. Good boy, Bucky. That's sort of what I want. Nope, snuck forward, so we're going to try again. And sometimes it takes a few goes. It's not perfect. They need to understand, though, that they're not allowed to, while they're on your time, and again, he snuck back. While they're on your time, they've got to be under your control and on your A's. Good boy. So we've got stop, go, park. Yep, easy, that's fine. You've got them all within three beats. Um, they're calm, they're obedient, they're consistent. More of a standard bread specific thing is the fact that when they've raced, they spend all of their time with a rigid shaft from here back. At this end, you've probably got, at the very least, your reins and a head check. You may have a lugging pole. You'll have something to that, to that, um, to that point of view where the horse is absolutely straight. He travels in a rigid, straight line the whole time. He has no ability to bend. The only bit of ability that you'll get is at this pivot point here where obviously your head check and your reins are connecting to a saddle and the um, shafts of the cart haven't quite stopped his movement. So the only pivot point that you're going to get here at the shoulders. That comes into play a little bit later when I speak about canter. But the biggest thing with standees on the ground is getting them to understand that their back end can move independently from their front end. Usually this blows their mind. Um, you can see them, they're actually quite chuffed in terms of the way they're moving and they're like, Mum, did you know my legs can do this and they can go here and my body can do that? And, oh, it's amazing. Um, and it's quite funny to watch because you do see the little cogs turning and they're digesting that bit of information and realising that when you ask them to do stuff with their body, they can actually do it. Um, so to that end, what I like to do is actually just begin the process of getting him to step his hind leg across. So he's moving away from my whip pressure. So all I need to do, some of them will be a little bit funny about having a whip near them because they're not sure what you're going to do with it. So the first step sometimes is to actually habituate them to your whip. And that's just placing them, placing the whip on them very calmly, stroking them with it, um, just basically saying, I'm not going to do anything with this other than give you an aid in a second. If he moves away, it's really important that I stay with him and the whip stays on him. He needs to understand that moving away from the whip doesn't remove it because otherwise you know what he's going to do next time. He's going to walk straight away from it because that removed the thing that he didn't like. So once you've got him habituated and he's fairly comfortable, if he moves away again, we're just following him. And we follow and we follow. Good boy. And we just want to tap him just lightly. This is where your timing's critical. I want it to step across. There we go. And I take the pressure off. I don't want him to keep moving away. I don't keep ha ha tapping and hassling him. I want one step away. If he goes to move without me actually giving him an aid, I'm not doing anything. My whip is up here. Sorry, these guys probably can't see. There we go. Good boy. Habituate to the whip. No aid. Tap. Leg comes over, whip comes off, we want him still. And again, you want to do the same thing on the other side. I will turn him around so that we can get this side to see a little bit of what I'm doing. Good boy. Woo. Woo. Woo, mate. Testing, testing your ambidexterity here when you've got to have your whip in your left hand. So you can see Buck, and he's always like this. For some reason, the whip on the left hand side does worry him a little bit. So you normally do have to spend a moment just getting him habituated and you can see he's really trying any number of responses to try and remove that whip as a stimulus to him. So it's a matter of just staying on him, staying with him till he gives up. Good boy. And a tap. Move leg comes over. Uh -uh. No. So you're leaving the whip on his body, not giving him an aid. There you go. Good boy. Tap, leg comes over, take the weight off. Hey, 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 hey. Relax, little man. It's a bit stressful here. So we'll try one more time till he gets it right with one stride only. There you go. That's it, that's it, that's it. All right. Good boy. And you may have to stay and stick this out. They're horses, they're not machines. Wrong answer, so I want to keep tapping. When he kicks out like that, it's really important that I don't take that tapping away from him because once again, he gives a response of a kick, the whip tapping stops and suddenly, well cool, that worked, I'll try that again. Tap, tap, keep tapping because he's doing that. Tap, 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 there you go. And you may have to get stronger with your whip taps. 
When he's upset, you're just holding it on him. Oh, man. There you go. All right. Oh, dear. All right. Relax. No, that's the wrong answer. I don't care. Like I said, it's not always easy and it's not always, they're not always robots. But ideally, that's what you want. So we'll, you may need, in the interest of time, I'm under time pressure here. So in the interest of time, I may have to skip this for a day. I wouldn't like to do that at home, but I may have to do so. Because I'm also upsetting him. And when you want to get on and he's stressed out and upset, you're going to have a really hell of a time if you're upset and frustrated and he's upset and frustrated. So you go back to something that he knows and something that he's okay with just to get him and you back on track. And that could be something just as simple as getting him to step forward and halting and getting him to step back, getting his brain back on the job, something that he's comfortable with. You have to take a step backwards to take a step forwards. We mate. Step back. Good boy. Good boy. There you go. We can see his body language is starting to soften a little bit. Good boy. So we will just do, literally, some things that he's happy with and he's comfortable with. Step back. Good boy. And I don't know if it's as apparent up in the stands that he's here, but he suddenly dropped an inch. Because he's back, oh, okay, I can do this. I'm all right, I've, I've got this. And you can then go back to doing your lateral work and introducing your new stuff. And this translates again under saddle, which I'm going to jump on now and explain a little bit why sometimes you need to leave things alone for a moment and not just continue persisting. Um, go back to something they like, get them settled, then start again. So with the backing process, normally I like to have a really nice big mounting block. And um, I spend a little bit of time beside them because the biggest thing with the standard breads in terms of backing is normally when you initially appear right here, up above them. So the standees are so great in terms of being mouthed and everything like that. But the moment that you appear above them is not something that they've ever had before. And so they will potentially sort of shoot forward or get a bit of a fright or get a bit of a shock. I like to try and introduce the concept on my mounting block first. A lot of people go, look, they're that great and they're that quiet. Uh -uh. This is where your part comes into play. If he starts moving, you want to shift him back where he was. Oh, mate. So, unfortunately, though, I'm operating with a much smaller block than I'd like today. But ideally, what I'd like to do is spend some time hanging over the saddle. In the, meet, in the interim, literally just this, just leaning over, tapping the saddle, lifting up the stirrup leathers, moving everything around, trying to keep him in park. If he shifts, we step him forward. Oh, lad. Back to the position that he was in, we park him up again. Like I said, ideally I probably wouldn't um, advise that you back a horse in the um, horse rail uh, arena at Equitana, but hey, we're all up for a challenge every now and then. So once we've got them settled, and again, look, he's moving away, and we park him up, and we stand him. We may. Hey, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. We're going to get on board. So Buck's making my life extremely difficult today. Wait, stand, stand. Good boy. Up we get. I like to keep my feet out of the stirrups when I first back them. Just to ensure that if anything's going to go amiss, I am ready to jump off at a moment's notice. We may. So in the initial period of time, when you're first backing them and first getting on, one of the biggest things to note is the fact that, quite simply, legs mean nothing to these horses right at this point in time. You need to be able to associate an aid that he already knows with this new aid, which is going to be obviously your legs and your heels tapping him. So obviously a click in most harness racing stables is going to be your go forward button. Oi, mate. Buck's extremely keen today. So what we do is we click and we actually add that leg tap in a fraction of a second after the click. It's almost instantaneous. 
and leg goes on, and he goes forward. Now, as I said, Buck's a little bit further along than, um, than a breaking, so you might have to really click, 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 click with the tap until he actually does step forward. Because the horse is trialling new responses at this point in time. He's got pressure on him, and um, he doesn't actually quite know yet that the answer is go forward. So you need to be able to associate the click that he knows with the leg aid that he's learning and setting them forward. And it seems really basic, but you've got to really establish that light aid. Again, we're going back to having three beats that he's got to respond. He's got to not be dull and sluggish and I don't have to kick, kick, kick. And likewise, I don't want him to shoot off at 100 miles an hour either. So again, we're going to halt, test that we've got brakes and leg on, just a tap. Once he's moving, it's super, super important to stop harassing him. If you keep riding and kicking every stride, the horse is going to habituate to that. You're going to end up with a really dull horse that's not moving and not travelling because he's ignoring you, essentially. So, we're lucky with Buck in that he raced 113 starts as a pacer. However, he has very little pace in him under saddle. It's not always the case, we've been lucky with him. However, there's luck and there's good management. There's a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. What we want to do with the pace, if it's appearing in the walk and the trot, it's almost definitely going to appear in the canter when you're retraining standard bread. Like it, this guaranteed, it, it's going to appear at some shape, some stage, some form, usually in your transitions. But if it's appearing here at this point in time in your walk and your trot, what you actually need to do is bring them into a downward transition and start again. The more that you, the more that you allow the pace to be expressed, the more that the neural pathways in his little brain are going to develop and strengthen. And 113 starts of pacing, his neural pathways for pace are right up there. So we really want to delete it. Any time that it comes out, um, whether that's in an ambling type walk or in the trot work or anything, it's a simple and very quick downward transition. It's not aggressive. You're not hauling them back and stopping them and, and getting really angry at them. It's just a really calm way of saying, no, that's not quite what I'm after. As you'll see, I've got him just in a really neutral frame. Um, you know, I'm not asking for a, a show ring carriage or a dressage frame or anything like that. Um, I would almost suggest that you had a loose rein, except you will find with the standard breads that um, some of them, when you think about their, their training as a racehorse, they have no legs, no seat, no connection to their person apart from the reins. And the little chestnut that I did, the Gary Owen one, was a perfect example of this. He was, a, um, he was an interesting horse to retrain in a number of different ways. But for a long time, you couldn't give him a loose rein because he thought you'd evaporate it, out of sight, gone, disappeared. Because his only thought or connection that the, to the person was through his mouth. You drop those reins, you, oh, where, where'd she go? She's, she's gone, she's left me. And he would get really distressed about that. So it's worth noting that sometimes with a standee, what we think we're doing with a really lovely loose rein is actually a little bit stressful for them because they're not quite comfortable with the comfort that you're providing with your legs wrapped around them and your seat securely in the saddle. They, they are still convinced that you might have evaporated. So it's worth a little bit of trial and error with your horse to see whether, um, you know, they are more comfortable with a contact. Buck's not particularly panicked about having a loose rein, but he does certainly like to be held um, with a firm but an elastic type contact. Right. When I ask him to trot, and again, the same concept as the walk comes in to the trot work in terms of either using the word trot or clicking. As I said, we're very lucky with Buck that the quality of his trot is quite good. Um, as it is, he's only six months in, but he has not really at any point in time shown a huge tendency to pace, at least not in the trot work. So we're lucky that way. And once we've got him trotting again, we don't want to hassle him and kick him with every single stride. We want him to go into cruise control. And I do find the standees pick up this concept reasonably well because they do quite a number of miles of jog work in cruise control. 
So what you'll need to do is actually really focus on yourself as a rider. That once you've got them going into a nice tempo and a nice rhythm, that you're not nagging with your legs. Just you need to develop a really nice, consistent, rhythmic trot without you having to nag every stride. Good boy. And again, if that trot becomes ambly, it's a simple downward transition. I'll explain Buck's um, sliding stops in a moment. But that simple downward transition, then bringing them straight back into trot. You don't need to do half a lap, but it's no, that's not what I'm after. Try again. Good boy. And then, once you're fairly happy, you've got walk and trot established in terms of the aid, what you need to think about, because this will help you with your counter work, is that they've got, at the very least, a neutral flexion, but ideally, you want them to begin a correct round flexion in your circle work. The reason for that, as I alluded to a little bit earlier with, oh, you're right, Buck. Um, as I alluded to earlier with the, the sulky shafts and things like that, is that the standees really have a tendency when they're racing, if you've ever watched a harness race front on, to corner like Valentino Rossi on a Grand Prix motorbike. That shoulder is the leading shoulder and we are leaning as far in as we can. And any of you that have ridden a standee in the early stages of their riding process will be familiar with that lean. That makes it exceptionally hard for him when it comes time to canter for two reasons. First of all, mentally, his brain is stuck really strongly in that racing mode of leaning in on that shoulder and hammering along at 100 miles an hour. So he's in pace mode mentally. So you're gonna be more likely to get a pace out of him when his body is set up to pace. <coughs> Excuse me. And then secondly, from a canter perspective, in terms of getting the right canter lead, Yes, he's going to pick up this outside hind first, but this one needs to be able to come off the ground. And if all of his body weight is on it, he's going to have a super hard time getting that leg up off the ground to pick up a correct canter lead. So you want to really try, before you really attempt too much in the way of canter, to make sure that you've got at the very least a neutral flexion and ideally a little bit of a correct flexion. You're just starting to see his corner of, the corner of his eye. I stopped in that spot twice and he remembers. He's a clever character. So ideally you want to have that, just the corner of that eye peeking through. I wouldn't advise that you begin a horse's canter training of any breed, let alone a standard breed, in a 20 by 20 arena. But that's what we've got today, so that's what we'll work with. What you will need to do, pick a corner, and every stand is going to have a spot in your arena that it likes best. Try to use that one. Don't make life harder for yourself. Don't worry about that. What you want to do though, is you're going to sit for a beat. If you need to lift this inside hand up in order to help that flexion, do so. You're not pulling it back because you're going to either pull him down or curl him round, but you want to lift it up almost in like a neck reining type fashion. Lift it up and against him so he's there. Your inside leg is also on the girth helping support that. You sit for a beat, your outside leg goes on the girth. Counter. Good boy. Uh-oh, there you go. And even that, for a first canter, was too much. In the first few canters that I ever ask, I want two or three strides, and then I stop him, and I tell him I love him, and he's so amazing. <laughs> you, standies love to be told that they're clever kids. They love it. But they really do need a little bit of mental cuddling Particularly the trotters. I know I've spoken to a few of you over the last few days mm -mm, with trotters. And um, particularly for them, mentally, canter is a challenge because they've been told their entire racing lives, no, 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 very wrong. So you need to make it abundantly clear that it is absolutely right now. So we'll go through that canter transition a couple more times. Inside rein on the neck, a little bit up if we need help with the flexion. Outside leg behind the girth. Good boy. And back. Good boy. You start with three strides, you do six. You do half a lap, you do a lap, and away you go from there. At any point that the counter quality deteriorates, you come back. 
You don't ride. I, look, I know there's schools of thought where you can ride through a pacey canter into a correct one. I don't subscribe to those schools. I do think it needs to be correct from the start. Good boy. Keep in mind, Buck is six months into his re-education. So, he's doing a really good job at this point in time. Early days, you'll notice I'm riding with a light seat. I'm not in a two-point jumping position. You can see that because he's confused. But I am just lightening my seat bones. It just seems to allow their backs to free up in the early part of the canter work. See that canter deteriorated? I brought him back. Good boy. Oh, man. So it's really super important that you're very strict on yourself and on them in the early parts of your canter. I'm not that impressed if you say, I've got 20 laps of tranter and it was great. I would love that you did five or six strides of beautiful three beat canter, brought him back, gave him a kiss and a cuddle and then started again. You will always get that better quality canter through not allowing them to express the crap canter. Simple, it's gonna be easy for them to amble or to have a four beat pacey type canter. It's in their nature, it's in their makeup and it's in their musculature. So in the early days you need to be super strict with them and with yourself that you don't accept anything other than A grade. Once he's established a little bit in his canter, you actually change up your position. And it's a fine balancing line to work out exactly at what point in their re-education that you do this. Because what you go from, canter, good boy, is this light sort of just off the saddle cuddling position to shortening your reins a fraction, sitting up, really tall, you've got a strong and elastic contact, but suddenly, I don't know if you can see it, but certainly for feel, he's starting to sit back on his hocks a little. He's starting to lift, I can feel the saddle coming up, his withers are lifting, and this canter is becoming more three beat. I will point out that it's extraordinarily difficult to talk and canter. Steady mate. Good boy. Now, every horse is going to have a good rein and a bad rein. With the standees, often the left rein is a good rein. Not always, but often. It's the way that they race. So they spend a lot, a lot, a lot of time going around to the left. So that's usually the better rein. Um, chatting with our lovely muscle workers today, which I saw one in the crowd somewhere before, we were talking about Buck having a loading leg. And um, lo and behold, which one do you reckon it is? Could be the near fall to the left. So he's become so accustomed to over 113 starts and nine years of loading his left leg up that even on the right rein, he still thinks it's a good idea to load the left leg up. So it's quite interesting to see the difference between the two canters. And initially, Buck could not pick up right canter to save himself. He absolutely couldn't. And a little bit like where we failed a bit with our, um, with our leg yield earlier on the ground. Sometimes you've got to adapt. The wheels fall off, you've got to figure it out. So then we just went to any canter leads a good canter lead, as long as he's responding to the aid. When I say canter, he canters. You can refine the rest of it a little bit later. Same concept though applies on the left lane to the right lane. Right lane? Right rein. That inside hand goes up against his neck, try to correct the flexion. For Buck, he really likes to fall in on this shoulder. So I often have a crop or a whip placed on his shoulder. I'm not hitting him, but it's just there as a bit of a reminder to stay off that shoulder. Get the flexion correct first. And again, we're going for a light seat. Canter. Good boy. You can see the buck struggles on this right rein a lot more than he does the left. Ooh. Good boy. 
but he's getting there and he's offering up the correct responses. So the refinement comes along as we go. So again, counter. Good. And you can see sometimes, although he did do it yesterday, he's not doing it today, you'll almost get like a little pig root out of him. And it's not a bad pig root or an aggressive pig root, it's simply that he's trying to reorganise himself in behind. You know, those hind legs are doing some weird stuff that he's not used to. So be aware of that, that you might get that and you have to make a bit of a judgement call as to whether it's a disobedience or whether it's him just getting himself sorted. Good boy. So we'll try one more time and again I'll try and sit up this time and use that stronger elastic contact and my seat to attempt to drive him into a little bit of a jump and three beat tight canter as opposed to our four beat runny establishing canter that we start with. Get up. So keep in mind we are looking at all of the people moving around. But we want to sit up. And it's starting to deteriorate. So we bring it back. Good boy. Good boy. Steady, steady, steady. But for six months into a retraining career versus nine years of actual harness racing experience. He's done a remarkable job, but it's not that remarkable. I just want to you know, impress upon everyone that he's watching, that none of what I'm telling you is particularly groundbreaking. It's not some new science that's just come to pass. It is literally just pressure and release type training with a really strong focus on building the blocks from the ground up, from your groundwork all the way through until you do get on, until you do trot, till you do canter. All of those things that we worked on on the ground fed through. And the canter work, you often have to go slow to go fast. It's as simple as that. You need to be able to be happy with doing three strides of really quality canter and being, yep, yeah, cool, we're done for today as opposed to trying to do endless laps and endless circles where the quality of the canter isn't there. So I do have our um, Harness Racing Australia do have some DVDs or some videos that we have filmed of Buck's progress and we have done these in real time. So essentially each of those videos, they're up on YouTube. Um, we've got a YouTube channel which is There Is No Finish Line. So each of those videos has been done probably a couple of weeks after Buck had reached that particular milestone in his retraining. So it's quite real time, so you'll see him in the beginning, shaggy, with a lack of top line, looking like a racehorse. You'll see him clipped out in the middle, looking mouse grey and really interesting. And you'll see his progress in terms of the work that he's doing um, and his strength and his ability. So I really advise you to go and jump onto those YouTube videos and have a look at them because what I've done here today in 45 minutes is um, pretty difficult to, to condense. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight. Do come and visit the standard breeds in the breed village. Um, Buck is here under the HRV Hero banner. So you'll see us all in our purple and green outfits. He's right near the front. Come and say hello. All of the guys there would love to chat about all things standard bread. I'm also going to be there. I'm happy to answer any sort of individual queries or questions that I haven't covered off here today. Um, but I hope you've sort of enjoyed and got something out of what we've gotten today and um, that you're suitably impressed with 10 year old, 11 year old veteran who's managed to come into the Equitana Arena 200, uh, 200 million starts later and do a pretty good job of his retraining. So thank you all very much for coming. Good boy, you're all right. Good.